From two dirty painters to multiple seven-figure business owners, I'm Radio. And I'm Carmelo. We'll be giving you guys the insider secrets to take your trades business to the next level. From crazy stories to proven strategies, get ready to supercharge your business with us. Welcome to the Dirty Painters Podcast. In today's episode, we'll be breaking down the basics of bookkeeping for painters, explaining why it's important for your business, key terms you need to know, and how it can benefit you in the long run. Let's get right into it. All right, classes in session, bookkeeping right. 101. This is literally like, a, this should be a college course, I think. A lot of uh, financial education stuff should be yeah. mandatory. Why bookkeeping is important? You, because you're not very involved in the financial side of the business. You're more like production and field and supervising crews. Why do you think bookkeeping is important for you as a business owner? Just give us your own perspective because I think your perspective would be more accurate and more relatable, relatable to, to the, our audience and other business owners out there that they don't really know why bookkeeping is important. So the reason I would think bookkeeping is important is to basically, number one, having everything organized. Number two is knowing where your money is spent, where your money is coming in, which basically goes back into organizing it. And uh, number three, seeing if you're actually doing good or if you're doing bad, it's a good indicator of health for your business. It's pretty much like a good roadmap mm -hmm. that's showing you which direction your business is heading to. And also not only showing you which direction your business is heading to, it's showing you if that direction is good. Is it a straight, tall way, fast highway road, no obstacles, smooth ride? Or, or is it a dirt road? <laughs> or is it like a dirt road? Are you going to pop a tire as soon as you go into it? So that's why I think it's important. It's like a good road map that shows you which direction you heading towards, which direction you can decide to go to, or if you're heading towards a bad direction. And then we're going to dive into a little bit more of the terminologies and a few very important things that you need to know when doing bookkeeping or when reading financial reports, because that's what pretty much bookkeeping is. It's financial reporting of your business. And you need to know those terms. All right. So some of the basic accounting terms that uh, we think almost everybody should know out there. Number one, assets, a resource that your business owns or controls that can be expressed in a monetary value, meaning your truck, if it's paid off, your business on its own can be uh, an asset, petty cash, which is the cash that you have in your bank account, equipment, et cetera, or if you own your shop, that can also be classified as an asset. Basically or, anything that you can liquefy. Or equipment too. Yep, yeah, equipment, oh, you, yeah. Okay. yeah. Like your pumps. Uh, Sanders. Uh, ladders. Or like if you have an epoxy business, you can have a $20,000 sander. Yeah, or like these guys that they do the parking lot uh, lines, they have those expensive twelve, fifteen thousand dollar laser sprayers. That's an asset. All that expensive equipment that you have, those are assets as well. Another thing that I would add is also your digital assets, your website. If you have a strong Instagram page, if you have strong SEO, if you have a strong Google presence, all those things are assets as well. Because, for example, you can sell your Instagram page. A lot of people don't know That's that, true. but it's like a what is it, fameswap.com, that you can go there and you can uh, see how much Instagram accounts are worth. You can get an estimate, like you can get an appraisal of your Instagram account. A lot of people don't know that. Like your followers are an asset. And then those kind of platforms and uh, digital asset brokerages, they put a monetary value in all your digital assets. Because let's say your business grows and then you get enterprise value out of it, you can sell it. So all those things tie in as assets as well. And then the next account term, which goes hand to hand with assets is liabilities, which means debts or financial obligations, meaning your credit card bills, if you have a finance vehicle, business loans, anything like that. So any money that needs to go out for the business to operate, it's pretty much a liability. When you have to pay your electricity bill for your shop, that's a liability. When you have to pay your guys, your payroll, that's a liability. Like Carmelo said, your truck payments, your truck maintenance, because your trucks, especially if you're running a fleet, you have to maintain those vehicles regularly. What else? Your internet bill, your phone bill, those are all liabilities, or, or your tax payment, which maybe you're paying them 
quarterly, maybe you're making monthly payments or at the end of the year, those are liabilities. And then you need to track all of them to understand how much money you need to make every month. A lot of times um, there's like set liabilities. For example, your shop rent, your, your, uh, your, your overhead. We call that overhead. How much money it takes for the business to just keep its lights on. Not make any money just to run pretty much, just to turn the key and then the business is active. Next one, equity, the amount of capital invested or owned by you as the owner. That can also be classified in percentages. Like if you're a 50% uh, partner with somebody else, uh, let's say the business is worth 100,000, then 50,000 will be your share. Correct. So for example, if uh, me, and Car like me and Carmel are business partners, we're uh, equal partners in our business. If we were to sell or if we were to split money, we would take the equity of the business and then uh, on those percentages. Also, any money of our own money that we put into the business. For example, we wanna make a big investment or we wanna buy some new equipment and we uh, inject cash into the business. Uh, let's say we put 20 Gs to buy a new van of our own money because remember, you have to separate your personal assets and your personal money versus the business money. So let's say we put our, our own money that's gonna get classified as equity of the, like the owners put money into the business to help it grow. Or a lot of times people will put their own money when their business is going under and try to make it survive. I was uh, reading, I was listening to this cool story of the FedEx company actually. They were uh, in the beginning, they were bleeding money. So the owners, they were putting their <laughs> own money. And then I can't remember the, uh, the one of the founder's name, but what he did, he took their last $15,000. They had to make payroll for the month. So he took his last $15,000 and he went to Vegas and he played did. blackjack. And he turned that 15,000 to like 45 something. And that's how FedEx was able to- Stay afloat. Stay afloat for that month. And the next thing you know, you get, they got a contract or whatever, and then just fucking, the rest is history. <laughs> they are where they are today just because so, of blackjack. So that was a capital investment of the owner, the 15 Gs to go play some blackjack to get make payroll that month. And there's a lot of these crazy stories of people out there that uh, they were like barely surviving, like one step before falling off the cliff. And then they put their own personal money and they just turned it around. So yeah, that's an equity investment into your business or cash injection of your personal money. Revenue, money generated from normal business operations. You can also classify revenue as sales. And then a big misconception is when somebody hears the word revenue, they think to their head automatically, oh, that's how much money a business makes. That is so far from the truth because then you have your liabilities that you need to account for. So yeah, when you I, hear these guys, oh, I would do 10 million in revenue a year, but they net 200, 500K, that's... So a lot of people out there that flex uh, the revenue be like, oh yeah, we do five, we make five million dollars a year. What's your net? How much money actually are you keeping from that five million or two million or a million or a hundred K, whatever it might be. Let's say, oh Carmelo, we did a hundred K this week, man. We fucking killed it. And then if you really look at the numbers, we're let's say we're only running a 10% margin. So we actually generate a hundred G's to make 10 K. It's not a good metric to see if a business is uh, making money pretty much. It just it's how much money came into the business. And then you, you look at your gross revenue and then you look at your gross profits and then you look at your net profits. There's other metrics that actually show you, but it's a good indicator to see how much volume is going inside the business, how much money is being sold and how much money is being collected and going into the bank account. Expenses, the cost or money your business spends to generate revenue. And again, just like how we said earlier, and a good, uh, I remember this from my financial education class, class uh, gross profit is revenue minus expenses. And then when you add your overhead on top of it, that's going to be your net profit when you deduct it from your gross profit. What episode did we do that we're explaining everything? Is it the KPIs episode? Yeah, so we have an episode that literally teaches you how to calculate net profit, gross profit, overhead, how to like um, work that formula so you can understand uh, your net profits and how much money you're actually making. So pretty much the expenses, um, yourself could be an expense to the business. That's why we say it's very important once you grow past a certain level 
uh, to make yourself, put yourself on payroll, give yourself a salary uh, as, let's say, as a manager of the business or um, an estimator of the business, whatever your role might be in. That way you're an expense of the business because like we said before, your time is not free. You can, you have to pay yourself pretty much around the business. That's another big mistake that a lot of business owners make. Uh, and we talked about that in the beginning too, especially when we would estimate jobs and we were painting ourselves. We were not factoring in our time of us doing the painting. So we're just making the net profit money. And then a lot of jobs were like working for less than 15 bucks an hour. It was crazy. So that's, those are things like you have to make yourself, whatever you do in the business, you have to get paid from the business. You have to make yourself an expense because your time is not free. And then the net profit, whatever uh, partnership you have or however you split it, then you either take draws or you split with your partners, whatever your, your business or classification might be or however your business is set up. But always make sure you make yourself an expense in your business, whatever your time, whatever time you're putting in and whatever tasks you're doing. Cash collected, it's uh, basically the legal, ten the paper money that you're getting instead of the checks or the- How much money is hitting your bank account? Because a lot of people mistake sales and they're like, oh, I had a killer month. I did $300,000. I'm like, okay. How much money of that $300,000 did you produce and how much of that was collected? Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, they only collected and produced $110,000. So I'm like, okay, this month you didn't make 300, you didn't, uh, your revenue was not 300,000. It was whatever money you collected from that $300,000 that you sold. So cash collected is a very important metric that you need to keep an eye on. And then uh, compared to your sales, Let's say you sold three hundred thousand dollars for the month. How much money? Let's say uh, you brought in one hundred fifty k in cash collected, and that's how you keep track of. Also, um, can you produce jobs efficient and fast? Can you collect on time? If you sold a job in August first and you're doing it in uh, January, it's not gonna count for um, August. It's gonna count whenever you collect the money. That's another thing that you need to be aware of. You can't just say, "Oh, I sold one hundred k." and then you're collecting the money months down the road. So that's where the reconciliation comes in place. Now, how to set up your bookkeeping? Obviously, <clears throat> for the founders of CloudBooks, so that yeah. would be the most seamless way, in our opinion. But if you don't have the money to swing that yet, and you wanna do it yourself, a great alternative, great for beginners, will be QuickBooks, which right now is what, 15, $20 a month? It ranges, depends yeah. on your needs. Depends on uh, how much you need from the so, app in itself. Once your business is ready to go to the next, or like you can afford pretty much because our Cloudbook subscription is $4.99 a month. And a lot of starting, like us in the beginning, we could not afford $4.99 a month. In the beginning, when you don't have money, but you have time, you have to do certain things yourself. Bookkeeping is one of them. That's why you said also you go past the 300000 to $500,000 level, that's when you can start delegating tasks like bookkeeping to free up more of your time to focus on how you can grow your business. But in the beginning, if you're only doing 100K a month, uh, year to 200K a year, you cannot swing $6,000 a year to just pay somebody to do your bookkeeping. That's, you, you have great softwares out there, very user friendly. And us in the beginning, we used QuickBooks to for a very low payment. I think it starts, like Camilo said, at 15 bucks a month to keep track and organize your business. There's no excuse, even starting out, that your business should not be organized. And there's a lot of videos from QuickBooks and YouTube that teaches you how to do, how to use all those tools. And you can set up uh, consultations with them for free to show you how the platform works until you can afford a bookkeeper, an accounting firm to, delegate that task to them so you can free up more time. But yeah, QuickBooks, I'd, I think uh, at bare minimum from the day you start a business bank account and uh, a business pretty much, you should have your bookkeeping software in place to track money in, money out, how much money you're paying out to, to people and all that, uh, whatever expenses you have, everything needs to be tracked. Because also it's gonna save you time when you go file for your tax at the end of the year. Because think, 
you're completely unorganized. You just have receipts and you have bank uh, statements, not categorized, not filed, not anything. And you go to a tax uh, preparation guy and then you bring him a big folder with hundreds of receipts, hundreds of bank statements. It's going to take him time. It's expensive. He has to go through all that. He has to categorize it. He has to look at how much money you paid your guys, how many checks you wrote. It's going to be a pretty expensive bill plus whatever taxes you might have to pay versus when you have, when you're being proactive, not only are you keeping pulse on your business health, but at the end of the year, when you go to a tax preparer, you are organized. They have to do less work. So your bill with them is going to be way cheaper. That's another plus. That's why you have to be organized as well. Um, even if you're doing it by yourself. How to manage invoices and payments. With CloudBooks, we explained the process on our previous episode. Go back and watch that. Yep. But with QuickBooks, because I've used QuickBooks uh, sometimes, and uh, all, good platform for beginners, but sometimes it can be very finicky, especially when you have to send out deposits for ACH or oh, ETF. Yeah. Uh, and also uh, when you're categorizing something, uh, sometimes payroll, it will actually accidentally categorize it as another contractor, which can be a big mistake, especially later on in the year. Correct. That's the only thing. It can be very finicky. And we've done, we've made those mistakes. That's why we're bringing them up. Uh, the, my biggest issue with it was uh, when you would send out an estimate and they approve the estimate and you'd send a deposit, like us, we do 50% deposit. It would make the whole estimate, it would it turn into an invoice and it would make the whole thing due. And then um, it, it would not show proper on the statements. So they would, give us 50% and then it would show that the whole invoice was paid. And then we would have to generate another invoice. And then uh, the biggest issue with that is it showed that we brought in more money because every time, for example, when we use QuickBooks, every time you generate an invoice, it automatically slaps it on your cash collected. Like it automatically goes on your revenue for the month. And a lot of times, like for me, for example, I was not paying attention that that was happening so my numbers were overinflated. And then that can cause issues because first of all, you're not, you don't know how much money you're actually making. And second, you're showing that you're making more money than you actually are. So you got to pay more taxes. So that was a big issue that I didn't like uh, how it was working. So I was like, okay, I got to find a better way because it would take me a lot of time to go down and make sure I didn't have duplicate invoices or making sure there was not, I was not inputting extra money that we were not collecting. That was a big issue. That's why we completely switched. That's why uh, in the beginning, when you don't have a lot of transactions, you can keep track of it better. But when you're running hundreds of jobs and then hundreds of customers and hundreds of invoices are being generated, you can get lost. And next thing you know, you're collecting an extra 150K of money just because you generated duplicate invoices. About 150K, if you file it wrong, you got to pay tax on it. That was a big issue that we were seeing with that. And that's something you have to be aware if you're doing it yourself. Don't have double generated invoices and make sure you're sending them the right way. Now, the process is pretty seamless. You send the estimate, they accept the estimate, and then you generate an invoice. How we like doing it is we generate a separate invoice, completely separate from the estimate, and we're like, okay, 50% deposit for invoice number 1058. And then once that gets paid, we close it. And then when the remainder is due, then we generate a second invoice, balance due from invoice, whatever number we just said, and then we send that one out. That's the best way. It's the cleanest way versus trying to like collect money from the estimate from um, the one that was, it was very, it's very, um, how do you say it? It's very confusing. And then this next bit, uh, I've had this uh, request as a question. How do I manage payroll and labor costs? And these are a few points, which I'm going to tell you guys right now on how we can recommend you to manage your payroll and labor costs. Budgeting on each project. So every time you sell a project, you should uh, budget out. Let's Okay, so this is how much it's going to cost me for labor. It's how much I uh, expect the materials to be from this range to this range on the high end. Uh, these are my overhead expenses, and then this is how much I want to make from it. So you have to communicate that to your lead, 
tell them like, hey, this is how much we have for the market for the materials, and this is how much we have for the labor, and uh, this is going to be our timeline. Tracking your hours, how much hours each guy puts in. If there's any underperformance, you look into it. Like, hey, what's what's been going on? What happened on day two? We were supposed to be doing this, and we were still back on day one activities. So that way you can see if a crew is operating efficiently, or if you wanna, or if you have to move maybe some people around. Scheduling wisely, match your crews to the appropriate workload. So you don't want a top performing crew doing a little interior job for you. You want them to do the big interior job or the big exterior that you have planned because you're just using them for something that uh, basically they're not making you as much money. Check expenses regularly. Keeping track of your material expenses, especially on your Sherwin-Williams Pro Plus dashboard or if you're using Benjamin Moore, I'm sure they have another thing that you can keep your material tra uh, tracked. Always tell your guys to put a PO. It's, it can either be the client name or the address, so that way you know if you're overspending material on this job, and if you do, why, what happened, spillage, whatever, using the wrong tip, and uh, you can go back and uh, communicate with your guys to adjust that for future projects. Adjust pay. Sometimes you might be overpaying for labor. You never know. And then one last thing, pay electronically to easily categorize on your bookkeeping software and you can that way see your year-to-date payments for each employee or your subcontractor accurately. So you can keep track of the payroll and labor costs. We'll start with the budgeting on each project. When you're estimating jobs, you have to make sure you're estimating them properly. So you have to account man hours, man days, however you're uh, coming up with your formula. And you have that's when job cost analysis comes into play because you have to make sure that uh, you're hitting your forecast, you're hitting your goals. So let's say we're doing this interior and then um, our labor estimation was $5,000. And next thing you know, we're at $7,500 in uh, man hours, man days, whatever. Then we have to look what's wrong. We have to look why we didn't hit our margins, what went wrong, very important. And then um, in the beginning, once you fine tune your formula, you're gonna have a few screw ups, you're gonna have a few mess ups. But the more mess ups you have, the better you'll become as long as you're aware that you're fucking up and then you'll fine tune, you'll make your formula better so you're hitting those certain metrics. And then like Carmelo said, tracking hours is very important if you're paying your guys hourly. If you're doing performance pay, that's important. Why did it take them five days instead of the budgeted four days? And you talk with your crews. That's why the communication needs to be open between the crews, the crew leaders, the painters, to the project managers, to the estimators. You have to give, the estimators need to get feedback as well because they might be the one messing up, underbidding the jobs. We've seen that. A lot of times, estimators, they're underbidding jobs. The, what was the other thing? Schedule Excuse wisely, me. match your crews to the appropriate wor workload. So let's say we have a, a cabinet crew that it's really good at cabinet. We're not gonna put those guys on a two-story exterior it's gonna take them way longer. That's not what they're meant for. That's why what they're good at. That's why you have to match your crew. Or you might have a very slow crew that does good work. You can't put them into a production job. You can't put them on an exterior, like a 40,000 square feet exterior commercial job because they're gonna take forever. Commercial jobs, margins are way lower than residential. So you have to match your crews accordingly to the tasks and to their performance. That's why it's important to track crew's performance as well. Check expense regularly. I mean, you have to look. I'm uh, me. I look at bank accounts every day. I look, uh, and the good thing with Cloudbooks is uh, it categorizes stuff real time. So whatever money shows in the bank account, it automatically gets categorized. So I look at my reports, if not every day, at least every two to three days. And then another thing that we have set up is every time our contractors, our painters, our crew leaders are buying materials, Sharon Williams, even uh, Benjamin Moore, like Tanner Paint and all them, they send us the receipts real time. And then our software picks up the receipts with the bank, bank transactions and it matches them. So we have real time, we get an email and then uh, we look, okay, Jared's crew bought $4,000 worth of materials or they bought three gallons of this. That way we categorize our receipts and our material cost real time 
with a job cost analysis for each project. And then we'll take the receipts, we'll take the PDF, match it to the job cost analysis, and then the, our project manager reps, they have access to that and then do the same thing. That way we have real time, every day updated um, tracking for all our projects. Uh, adjust pay. What did you mean by that? Sometimes you might be overpaying some people when it's hurting you. And we've had yeah. that in the past. We've had, uh, uh, I think we've talked about this guy, the guy that was uh, uh, sent you a text about the, the oh, yeah, filters. Yeah. So we were overpaying him, so it wouldn't yeah. work out for us. So a good rule of thumb is like, if a guy costs you $200 for the day, he has to make at least double that. So he has to produce at least 400 bucks. And then you look at, is this guy consistently producing $400 worth of work to pay for himself and bring $200 in profit in the business? Or is a $200 a day guy only bringing in 250 or 280? Or 150. Yeah. For example, we, let's say we sell a garage door repaint for 800 bucks. And we send a guy there that's gonna cost us with materials and everything. It's, let's say we send a slow guy. It's gonna take him a whole day, 10 hours to do one garage door, uh, 30 bucks an hour, $300 plus material. So is that guy living up to the performance? Yes, he is. $400 cost with materials. We sold the job for 800. We have 50% margin. So that's good. He's a good guy. Let's say we send a guy that he's like, oh, it's gonna take me two days and that, and then he costs us 600 bucks. Is that guy good? No, he's not. He's costing us more money to perform the same job that um, the other guy would do it faster and cost less money. So you have to kind of track your guys if they're, you're paying them by the day, or you have to track your crews if you're paying them by the crew. If they're not hitting the certain margins, then they either gotta make less money, which that's not a thing, or they gotta be more efficient. So that's what we look more into. Um, if you are overpaying a guy, that's very common, and I see it a lot, especially with labor shortages, a lot of people are overpaying out there, and we were too. We're paying guys 25 bucks an hour, but they couldn't even spray, they couldn't even cut a line straight. So those guys, they're like, you have to trim that fat because uh, you're bleeding money. Also, they're slowing down the other crews, and also it's not fair to the guys that are making similar money to them and they're producing more because it can cause a lot of issues and a lot of conflict. Pay electronically to easily categorize on your bookkeeping software. So yeah, all our payments are electronically. Uh, very rarely we have to cut checks, very rarely. Um, most of our payments go out ACH electronically, automatic payments if they're on payroll or uh, Zelle, I mean, all our, we pay our guys as soon as the project is completed and we collect money. So most of the time we do Zelle. That's how we, we like doing it. And then crews and guys love it because as soon as we get paid, they get paid. We don't do like um, every other week or every two weeks. And then even when we, we had hourly and we, our hourly guys at the end of the week, Friday, they send us the hours, they get paid right away. That's the most efficient way. Um, because I remember when I was working for others, the biggest struggle, it was like waiting on my money. It would take forever to like, and I had to like, sometimes I had to drive to get a check, um, or they would just, my old bosses, they would drag, they, they would send checks in the mail, they would take forever. How, how many times we were waiting for checks for weeks? And he actually sent, he was sending the checks because I'll be like, dude, I need money. And uh, he's like, I sent the check. I'm like, it hasn't come in yet. And then he would cancel that check and then he would write me another one. Uh, and the next thing you know, the check like canceled showed up. So very inefficient. When you, if you wanna have good guys, the most important thing is paying them on time. It's very important to have the money going out to them mm -hmm. and like on time because all, a lot of people rely on paying their bills. At the end of the week, they need money. So paying electronically, it's very efficient. It keeps the morale high. And also it's very uh, easy to categorize your bookkeeping software and for you to keep track of payments. Versus you cut out a check, then you have to match a check number with uh, the contractor. The contractor. It's, it's a lot of work, unnecessary work that you don't have to do. Versus you do an electronic payment, the software matches it automatically the with name. the name, uh, puts it on your 1099 or your payroll, whatever. 
very, very efficient. Now, a little bit of tax preparation. And I've been getting a lot of videos of people trying to explain write-off, especially those uh, financial gurus or gurus that, uh, okay, I got this tax bill of 100K. I'm going to buy this Lamborghini truck. It's a Class A vehicle, and I'm not going to you know, owe any uh, taxes on it or stuff like that, which is uh, misinformation for the most part. And then an example I can give you, is let's say you made 100K net and you owe to the IRS 22 grand and you go ahead and buy yourself a pump that's two grand. That won't get your tax bill down to 20 grand. You subtract the two grand from your bottom line, which is the 100K and your taxable income becomes the 98K. So you get taxed on the 20% of that, which is gonna be 21,560. So all in all, you get that pump for a discounted rate of 1560 since it saved you $440 on your tax bill. This, that's the way I would explain a write-off. And you can't drive a Lamborghini truck and make a ride off if you're a painter, guys. <laughs> That's a vehicle, six yeah. six thousand pounds. Yeah, like you can be, you can pull up in a Lamborghini SUV or a G wagon as a painter and say it's a ride off. Like big red flag. Talk with our experts and CPAs, but it just doesn't make sense. Think like I'm a painter and I'm pulling up with a G wagon. Oh, it's a ride off. No, Let's talk with our experts. Schedule your free consultation. And our experts will tell you exactly what you can write off, how you can write it off, because there's a lot of intricacies. And that's why you need an expert so you don't have uh, your books unorganized and you're not doing things to fuck up your taxes pretty much. Or go to jail. Or uh, go to jail. I've seen a few people, uh, yeah, like, yeah I get, uh, I'll get the sports car or the supercar, and then if I use it for marketing purposes for my business, it's a full write off. Yeah, I'm gonna put this <laughs> tiny little logo of my company on the. <laughs> on my spoiler right underneath it and it's a full write-off. No, it's not. Don't go to jail for stuff, yeah. stuff like that. Or if you go to jail, just send us your commissary link and we'll put some <laughs> cigarette money there and nicked in gum. Uh, All right, next. How to keep everything all organized. What records do I need to keep? So if you have a bookkeeping software like CloudBooks, then the work is done for you through our CPAs and uh, what records you keep will be seamless because uh, at the very least, a ledger or QuickBooks, if you don't have the money to swing uh, for CloudBooks, that way you can keep track of your revenue, expenses on materials, insurance, advertising, technology, equipment, uh, license and fees, meals, office expenses, rent, uniform, utilities, vehicle expenses, whether it's gas or repairs, wages and salaries and taxes. Those are a few of the categories that you should keep track of and categorize on your QuickBooks, which I think they have all those categories. Yeah, sets. they do. No, it's great. You should have no excuse to keep everything in a notebook how we did. 15 bucks a month will give you, get you the basic QuickBooks. That way everything is organized. All right, operating income transactions, operating expense transactions. Yeah, you need that software to keep track of all that. What are, what's next? The biggest mistakes to avoid while bookkeeping, inaccurate entries, neglecting reconciliation, ignoring receipts, mixing personal and business finances is the number one thing I've seen personally. Mm -hmm. And then overlooking payment deadlines. That's mostly for the tax payments. Or credit card payments. Or credit card payments too. The interest charges that pile up. Interest charges, late fees. But the oh. inaccurate entries, the number one thing, it's... Uh, will get you in trouble with uh, the IRS. And so, especially if you're doing, uh, let's say a personal expense and you put it in as a business expense. Yeah. That's a big thing. Inaccurate entries. Yeah, you can, like we said, you can go or on, on, on a Vegas trip and make it a business expense because you went and talked to somebody. It's like a lot of the things that you have, re you need to have expert advice. And again, we're not giving any expert advice, disclaimer. You have to talk to certified and licensed CPAs to get that advice. We're just talking about what we're seeing that people are doing wrong and what we personally did wrong in the past. Like I said earlier, inaccurate entries, it might not be only for tax purposes, it might be double entering invoices. And then you're over inflating your, your money in because you don't, you don't track it properly or you're generating um, invoices. And then next thing you know, you're not keeping track of that and you have all these duplicate invoices. Paying guys out. Sometimes you pay, you, let's say you enter paying a guy twice, which it's gonna show us more expenses, but it's not accurate. Ignoring receipts, that's, it's important to keep track of your receipts 
And then uh, the other thing that we said, mixing personal business and finances, like you can't pay your personal vehicles out of your business account. That's number one thing. Or you cannot pay your mortgage out of your business account. Or uh, what else? What else can I think of? You can't pay for your vacations. Or your house utilities. Or your house utilities of your business your account. Your internet. Basically anything that's, yeah. uh, you know, your... Uh, anything that's not business, it should not be getting paid out of business. And then we see that a lot with uh, a lot of the people that we work with. They they mix those things up. And then um, it creates a lot of confusion and it creates a lot of work for whoever is preparing your tax at the end of the year. Look at every entry. And it's it's... Because I've been seeing, uh, for example, Shadi doing it. It takes a lot of work to go through all these months and months of statements and look at every transaction and pull it and organize it and enter it. It's a lot of work. It's a lot. It's very labor intensive. So the costs are justified. All right. Anything else that you want to add? I think for, on our the, bookkeeping one on one classes. I think that was the basic terminology that everybody should understand for. Uh, all of these uh, terminologies will be in your PLs. QuickBooks has a PNL uh, thing too. Uh, CloudBooks does too. PNL is a profit and loss statement, ba which is basically more uh, yeah. uh, detailed. That's what too. we look mostly at. Like I don't look at my balance sheet. I let Shady and my other guys. But what I l mostly focus on, as a business owner, is our profit and loss sheet, and then all my expenses. I want to see if I'm overspending, if I'm spending less, if I have more room to spend more in marketing. Uh, how much my my uh, labor expenses were for the month compared to our uh, money collected, uh, how much material we spent, keep track of, uh, hey, why did we only generate $100,000 but we spent 30 Gs in materials? That's 30% of the total money generated. What went wrong? Did we fuck up a bunch of jobs and overspend? Those are the things that as a business owner, like the PNL, you have to be looking at it. Um, I would say at least every week and uh, obviously every month, but every week you have to uh, be aware that way, if, you have, if you're seeing any issues, you can catch them on time before, before they become bigger issues. Yeah. After all this talk uh, in, in the original question on how I see bookkeeping, it's really just, just like how you do your yearly checkup at the doctors, but it's like monthly or weekly for your business. And the end result, which it's going to be your lab results, is the PNL statement. And that's where you can pinpoint or like, okay, we did good this month. Okay, we didn't do good. Why? Why are our expenses higher and our revenue is lower? Uh, it, it's it's a great thing to just Being, evaluate the health yeah. of your business and be aware of what's going on within your business. You have to know what's going on within your business. You have to monitor every single dollar that goes in and out. And being a business owner, that's I think the most important part of. Um, understanding how your business operates and if it's operating good and healthy. All right, so this will wrap up this episode of the Dirty Painters podcast. Be sure to follow our business on Instagram at Olympian Painting and also our personal accounts at Olympian underscore Radian and Olympian underscore Carmelo for more comp content and keep up with our episodes on the Dirty Painters podcast. If you like this episode, be sure to share with a fellow painter or tradie. Until next time, this is Radian. And I'm Carmelo. Signing off on the Dirty Painters podcast. Thank you, guys.